So in the winter months in Japan, you can pretty much draw a line right down the middle of the country, separating the part which gets lots of snow and the other side which doesn't get that much. And today we're on the very, very snowy side, uh, going to the town of Kitakata, a town which has the highest number of ramen shops per capita of anywhere in Japan. But we're not going to get to Kitakata until tomorrow because it's quite a journey from Sendai over to North Fukushima, especially given the heavy snowfall. But I am joined by a man who is dressed in a jumper that looks like looks like a bear suit or something. Looks like you've how many bears died for this jumper? No, you don't really have to, you know, to comment that because you don't have any sense of fashion. I don't have any sense of fashion. Yeah, and if, you know, you're the, you're the kind of person that with a hole in a sock. I, uh, all right, I have a hole in the sock, but that's that's British fashion sense. Along our journey across the snowy north to enjoy a bowl of Kitakata ramen, we'll be stopping off at two nearby towns, Aizuwakamatsu, a town nicknamed Samurai City, as it's home to one of Japan's top samurai schools. It's here we'll also be getting lost in a crazy looking temple inspired by no less than Leonardo da Vinci. And to catch a good night's sleep, we'll be dropping into a 200 year old inn in Yonezawa before waking up early tomorrow morning to dive into our ramen. Not literally, that'd be awful. And as per usual, Ryotaro is being worryingly vague about his master plan. We're going to do some combat training. Combat training. Combat training, yes. Combat training. Alright, so we're at the Nishinkai. That's one of the most famous dojos in the whole Japan. And this, is the, this was the school that the, uh, the, the young samurai used to go to. Established in 1803, the Nishinkan school turned children into elite samurai warriors, including the legendary Byakotai warriors or White Tiger Force, a reserve unit of samurai aged between just 16 to 17 years old. I must say there's an epic sense of scale to the school. It does feel pretty grand and spectacular. You could get a sense that some pretty rich kids learn how to do some crazy things here with swords and knives. Robin Dickhead. <laughs> Close. Steady. Steady. <laughs> no matter how, how many he tries, it's the same result. He just, he just cannot hit the target. <laughs> That's how you do it, Mike. How many times have you tried and then how many times are you going to... It's not important. It's like... <laughs> Winning isn't important, it's taking part that counts. It, it, whatever happens now, I'm going to hit it. Because if I miss, I'm going to use clever CGI film trickery to make it look like I hit it. And you won't be any the wiser. With, with, with the flame and everything, right? <laughs> Ready? Ready? Oh, I hit it! That was a really good shot. Did you see that? The way it hit the hit Does the that bullseye. Mean, right? That was brilliant, wasn't it? Let's go and let's go and look at a temple. So this rather strange, bizarre looking building behind me is called the Sazaidal Temple. It's a Buddhist temple that was built in 1796. And it's the only one of its kind in the world to have the rather strange and crazy wacky design that it's got inside it. Come and have a look at this. So the temple has a hexagonal design with two spiral staircases, one going up and one going down. It's pretty cool because you never actually meet people who are going up and down on the opposing staircase. They're completely divided. The idea being that uh, as you're praying to the 33 gods that are in the temple, you're never getting it congested. You're never getting in the way of people going up or down. It's pretty smart design. Like I've never seen anything quite like this. I've never seen so much thought being put into a temple's design. It feels a bit like a theme park ride because you can hear the footsteps on the uh, opposing spiral above or below. You can't see anyone. It's fun. It's like a horror house or something. And uh, speaking of horror, look, it's Ryotaro. <laughs> Standing on the crossing over bridge. This is the bridge that uh, leads you Next. back down onto the yeah. other spiral. So what, Leonardo da Vinci, actually, Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah, he designed the, uh, uh, this castle in France. Right. And uh, they actually used the exactly the same system that the, this uh, temple is how, how it's built. But how did it get to Japan? How did that happen? Right, the design of the, uh, uh, this castle in France somehow got to uh, uh, Akita and clan. 
um, the back then, Ajita Prefecture, and uh, the Lord actually had it. And the monk who actually built this temple actually saw the design, and he was like, oh, he got inspired by it. He stole it. And he stole and he, the idea, <laughs> and he actually built this place. Wow. So from Leonardo da Vinci's pencil, to the mountains of North Japan. Exactly. The how, that's even Brilliant. How, how far it got reached, straight. That's what theft looks like. Yep. <laughs> so I just walked around the back of the temple and there's a monument here, which it turns out was donated by Benito Mussolini in 1928. Uh, Mussolini was inspired by the story of the Byakotai Samurai Warriors, a group of uh, about 20 16 to 17 year olds who took their lives in a battle in the 1800s after believing their lord was dead. And after hearing the story, he donated this column from Pompeii, one of three columns that existed uh, in Pompeii, to the town. And uh, it still stands here today. It's pretty odd to think that's here. Uh, especially with the inscription on the back, which reads, Under the authority of ancient Rome, may this pillar stand as proof of the greatness of fascism for thousands of years. Now, fascism didn't last a thousand years, it lasted about ten minutes, but I can see what he was getting at by donating this. It's a testament to the loyalty of the warriors. There's also another one from Nazi Germany here. Probably won't put that one on camera, but... Uh, it's amazing the thing is still here. You couldn't get things like that out of Pompeii now, given it's a World Heritage Site. So this is sauce katsudon, the uh, local staple food of Aizawaka Matsu. Katsudon is one of my favourite dishes, breaded pork on a bed of rice. Here in Aizawaka Matsu, they take that wonderful dish and drench it in about a gallon of uh, Worcester, Worcester sauce. sauce. And look at the size and scale of this. Ryotaro ordered this for me. He's got like a normal human portion. You call this normal, and but in this in this restaurant, this is like this is a mini sauce katsudon, and this is the this is the ordinary normal katsudon. It's like a bucket of a bucket of food. You could feed half of Okinawa. With That's a UK size, isn't it? Size. Well, oh, American, American right. size. Oh, yeah. Katsudon is one of my probably top five favorite Japanese dishes. It's a really great fast food. But the key to good katsudon is getting a nice crispy batter. Uh, around it with the succulent juicy pork within. Uh, if you get that right, it's like biting into heaven. Mussolini would have loved it. Si, buono, buono. This. Just arrived at Shirabu Onsen, buried deep under a pile of snow. Call me Mr. Health and Safety, but the entrance is slightly terrifying. There are daggers of ice hanging overhead. That's right, daggers of ice. Very poetic, but a little bit scary, not going to lie. Probably quite a good murder weapon, but I don't think that's a, a topic I should, should probably discuss right now. Let's go in. This fish used to be my father. <laughs> what? He's been reincarnated into a fish. What's happened? Rotter has drunk some alcohol for the first time in a while, and this is the kind of ridiculous dialogue we get. How do you actually eat this? It's, what it is, it's just, just a fish. Just, just bite, just get on it. A fish on a stick. Uh, Everything's on a stick in Jap here. Japanese food, <laughs> most, most of the dishes here. The dishes, Skewer, the dishes we've got here are very eloquent, very nice, very well presented. And then there's just a fish on a stick. I'd love, I'd love to be able to catch an actual fish like this. Just impale it on a stick. Walk along a stream with a stick, and then... Whoosh, whoosh, no, it doesn't work like that. No. no. It wasn't... No, they didn't use stick to fish it. They used fishing rod to fish it. You reckon? Yeah. But, fish on a stick aside... Enough for the fish. Uh, this is the real star of the show. This is yeah. called Imoni. It is the dish of Yamagata Prefecture. I used to have it all the time when and, I lived here. And be careful when you talk about Imoni to Yamagata people. What do you mean? I mean, if you say any bad things about Imoni to Yamagata people, and they'll kill you. They'll, I'm serious, and they'll kill you. Don't know if they take things Literally. that far, but uh, they are certainly proud of their soup. They won't commit hom homicide uh, or murder, but... It's soy sauce-based soup <laughs> with beef, tofu, and leeks. All right, so uh, there's one for you. 
perfect dish from a cold winter's day. You've got the smell of the kind of the beef and the potato and the onions drifting up from the soup. Yep. It's beautiful. So this inn, this onsen, is ridiculously old. It's about 200 years old and the entire building is made of wood. And I'm going to show you the onsen in a minute uh, because the onsen, it's nice. It feels less like a hot spring and more like just a waterfall that they've like harnessed or stolen. Can you steal a waterfall? Don't know. Leave a comment below. And then the water actually flows out from the waterfall and out of the hot spring and just goes off into its own kind of stream and leaves the building. It's quite nice. It feels less like an onsen and more like you're just bathing in a natural waterfall or something. At the start of the new year, Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples across Japan burst into activity as families across the country queue up to pray for good luck in a custom known as Hatsumode. And Ryotaro is keen to start 2018 by grabbing some good fortune of his own. So religion isn't um, the religion that maybe the Western people um, like we think of in this country. It's more like custom. More like a philosophy, a customer. Exactly. So people come here to shrine, uh, to pray for good luck. But that doesn't mean that you actually strongly believe in the religion itself. We don't really learn about, like, you know, this the, the in-depth uh, knowledge about the Shinto, Shintoism anyway. So we just come, come here because it's a tradition. Well, I read that most Japanese family. people are atheists. Yes, yeah, we are atheists, I think. We just follow the custom, that's what it is. And uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we th many, many people think that there, is, there are gods, mm. um, and that's why people come here anyways. But um, yeah, we just, the custom. Your family comes, your father comes, mother comes here, so you come too. That's what it is. Hungry? Yes. Morning ramen? Morning ramen, I'm ready for it. What's it going to be? Chashu men? Chashu men. Sure you? Yes. Really? Yes. Needs to be it. So what is it? Uh, I don't know about that. So I just walked into the ramen shop. Before I've even looked at the menu, uh, we can smell the rich, overpowering scent of the salty, braised pork drifting across the room. The reason we chose this place, the reason Ryotaro chose this place, is he basically saw a really good photo uh, of a giant bowl of ramen covered in pork. He couldn't even see the noodles. No, underneath. Okay, <laughs> there, or, there, or there should be the noodles, there. I couldn't see anything. It's just, it's covered in pork. Covered in pork. Uh, and it's called Niku Ramen on the menu. Niku Ramen, meat ramen, literally. Uh, with with Kitakati, you've got an absurd amount of ramen shops to choose from. Uh, and so you're really at the mercy of good photos and good reviews. So that's what brought us here to this yeah. one. But I'm ridiculously hungry. We've been driving for two hours across the snowy plains of Fukushima and Yamagata to Thank get Thank you, here. I was the one driving mine. Yeah, but my snoring kept you awake for the last two hours. Bloody hell, they weren't joking when they called it Niku Ramen. That was a shrewd move. There is a lot of meat. <laughs> see, I, I, could, I can't see yeah, the noodles. I can't see any of the noodles whatsoever. Mmm, let's try the pork. I like it. I've nailed it. The meat is very good. You think with this amount of meat, it wouldn't be very good quality, but very succulent, juicy, well done. It's not dry. Perfection. About 800 yen, so that's about the it's average price for a bowl of decent seven, bowl of ramen people. with pork. That's probably quite, that's reasonable given the amount of pork they've put in it. It's quite a light broth, it's not too thick, uh, which is good in the morning, you don't really want a heavy broth, it'll knock you out. I heard Kitakata's noodles are supposed to be kind of curly or something. Yeah, it needs to be. Um, the noodle itself kind of contains a lot of water, mm -hmm. um, that's why it's getting curly and it's kind of, how do you say it? Curly. <laughs> <laughs> Tried to film the uh, the guy preparing the ramen in the kitchen, but he wouldn't let us because he wanted to keep it a secret because there's so many ramen shops in this area and they needed to keep their recipe kind of a secret, naturally, as you'd expect. And now we're off to a ramen shrine because Kitakata is very clever. They've worked out how to exploit the whole ramen thing and make a shrine out of it.
I wonder where Ryotaro could be. <laughs> My father was fish, and I seem to be the ramen. Whatever that is, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Your father was a fish, and now you're a ramen. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm impressed you managed to fit in that bowl. Yeah, I mean, you want to try? No. What do you mean? No, that's what you. That's why we brought you here, so I don't have to do it's demeaning. For this. I don't for have to do this. demeaning ridiculous things. So right, right here behind me um, is the uh, the pictures of uh, ramens. Um, of the shops uh, that Kitakata has. Pictures yeah. of the ramens of the shops. Yeah, pictures of the ramen, pictures of the ramen ever from the, the shops. Ever the, ever, <laughs> ever the eloquent man. Exactly. Interesting thing about ramen is such a simple dish, right? Pork, noodles, uh, broth, and yet look at the diversity here on this wall. Look at the, the sheer range uh, in terms of diversity and appearance. So it's amazing, with one dish you can have so many different variations and uh, I guess for people living here it means you can always try something new. It's your new home. <laughs> this, this is going to get out, back, get out of come back and haunt you. Get out of my house. <laughs> so, um, what, so what is this? So unlike Westigi Shrine which is uh, uh, several hundred years old, this is three years old. <laughs> <laughs> shrine, which is called the Ramen Shrine. Ramen and normally shrine. in the center of a uh, shrine, there is no, normally there's a god, right? That, right. that protects the uh, shrine. Absolutely. And uh, what we see in there, do you see it? A bowl. It's a ramen bowl. It is a ramen bowl. And um, this is a ramen bowl from this uh, original ramen shop that actually um, uh, opened up in, uh, Kitaka, in Kitakata. And kicked it in, all off. Exactly, in the in 1920s. It's quite old, isn't it? It's 100, more than 100 years. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, close to 100 years old. Older than you. The history of Kitakata ramen goes back to 1925 when a Chinese immigrant called Ban Kinse arrived in search of his grandfather who was working in Fukushima. Unfortunately, he never found his grandfather, but to get by, Ban Kinse set up a Chinese noodle stand according to his home recipe. The dish proved very popular and soon many local shops began popping up to fulfil the demand of the hungry locals, with Kitakata's brand of noodles, Chuka Soba, literally Chinese noodles, becoming incredibly popular. And between the town's obsession with the dish and the unique noodles, the media discovered Kitakata ramen and exposed it to the nation, turning it into one of Japan's ramen capitals. One, two, oh, he did it. Made it. What did you wish for? So that I can come back here again and uh, eat better ramen. Better ramen? Better ramen. That's not very nice. Are you saying the ramen we had earlier wasn't good? No, it was good. It was really good. It's like even better ramen. Even better? Though. Yeah. We had an amazing time on our journey across the north of Kitakata and whilst the ridiculous snow might have been a bit nightmarish at times, there's no denying it made the journey all the more beautiful. You can find the details of where we visited on our trip in the description box below. The whole region we travelled in is accessible from Sendai Airport if you plan on renting a car. If you are renting a car, the good news is the highway companies now have a special discount pass similar to the Japan Rail Pass which can drastically cut the cost of highway tolls. And finally, don't be deterred by the language barrier. Most major rental companies in Japan have either trained staff or tablet assistants that make the process of renting simpler than ever before. So we're back here at Toyo to rent a car. If you need to book a car or get your reservation and you don't know any Japanese, don't worry, don't fear. I've got a little tablet system here where you can put in your details like so. Hello and welcome to Toyota Rent-A-Car. How may we help you? And then you can just put in Please touch the panel. your details like that. And away you go. So it's easy. Don't let the language barrier stand in the way of things. Tablets will do things for you. It's magical. It's the future, isn't it? As always, guys, many thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. I'm going to I'm gonna use... Uh, I'm going to uh, use CGI. Uh, I'm going to make a CGI scene of me actually hitting it. Uh, use some after effects. You there. and excuse me.